The role of the alarms on the ICU ventilator are to alert staff to critical changes that may highlight either potential harm or ineffective delivery of treatment to the patient. In this module, we'll review the common alarms that can be set for the ventilator and how to approach them. As a warning tool, alarms need to alert the caregiver that something has changed. Alarms may be visual or audible or both. Some are considered cautionary only, while others result in action by the ventilator, regardless of whether or not they are noted, such as the high pressure alarm. Furthermore, many alarms can be tailored to the patient's needs, and as such, only function if set and monitored appropriately. Alarms are essential to the safe mechanical ventilation of a patient. Routine assessment of the appropriate limits of the alarm settings is important and should be undertaken at the start of every nursing shift. Two of the most important alarms on the ventilator are the low and high pressure alarms. The aim of the high pressure alarm is to detect and prevent dangerously high peak pressures with the intention of minimising pressure related lung injury. This is of most relevance in volume regulated modes of ventilation where the pressure generated is dependent on the volume selected and the resistance of the circuit and airways. Pressure controlled modes by definition are limited to the inspiratory pressure set. Peak pressure is affected by inspiratory flow which in turn depends on inspiratory volume and inspiratory time and the airway resistance. To a lesser degree it's affected by lung compliance. The high pressure alarm is usually set within 10 centimetres of water of the desired maximum peak inspiratory pressure, or PIP, and when triggered, the alarm results in automatic cycling of the ventilator into expiration. This results in a truncated inspiration, and as such, much lower volumes are delivered than have been set. As a result, the lung is protected from the high pressures, but the consequence of this is that the patient may be dangerously underventilated. In practice, peak pressure alarms are set to around 35 to 40 centimetres of water. It should be noted that the alarm responds to the peak airway pressure, which largely reflects major airway and circuit pressures. It does not measure effective alveolar pressure which is more relevant to pressure-induced damage to the lungs. The list of causes include some conditions that can be rapidly fatal. This, combined with potential hypoventilation, mandates immediate attention when the high pressure alarm is activated. Potential causes of the high pressure alarm include tube obstruction, including biting of the tube, kinking, sputum obstruction, a closed suction catheter and herniation of the cuff over the end, migration of the tube into a main bronchus, usually the right in adults, sputum obstruction of the lower airways, profound bronchoconstriction, pneumothorax or rarely hemothorax, straining of the patient against the ventilator, often as an attempt to breathe dyssynchronously, extra pulmonary decreases in compliance, such as intra-abdominal compartment syndrome. The ventilator and circuit can occasionally contribute, but these causes are easily detected by removing the patient from the ventilator and hand ventilating. Patient-related causes result in great difficulty squeezing the bag. These causes lend themselves to a systematic approach starting at the tip of the tube and working down. Immediately passing a suction catheter and oscillating the chest can rapidly discern the cause. The peak pressure alarm is rarely modified, though in occasional circumstances it is increased. In severe asthma, there is a homogeneous increase in the airway resistance to gas flow. The higher resistance means that for any given volume, the pressure generated will be higher. An additional factor contributes to this, 
and asthma is largely a disease of limited expiration. A key feature of the ventilation strategy is to lengthen expiratory time as much as possible. This sometimes requires inspiratory flow to be increased so that the tidal volume can be delivered as quickly as possible. This increase in flow rate also contributes to raised peak pressures. The high pressure alarm is also increased when performing a bronchoscopy. The presence of the scope in the airway significantly contributes to resistance, increasing pressure in volume controlled modes. If the pressure alarm is not increased, the ventilator will cycle to expiration, underventilating the patient. Care should be taken to ensure that the alarm is returned to normal after the procedure. It is worth noting again that high airway pressures, which are measured at the mouth, do not necessarily equate with high alveolar pressures and the above situations are great examples of that. The extra resistance effectively washes off the higher pressures by the time gas has flowed to the lower airways. This is not necessarily true in heterogeneous lung disease though, such as chronic obstructive airways disease, where the resistance of some lung units is essentially normal and higher pressures applied will be more likely to affect alveolar pressure. Plateau pressure is thought reflective of alveolar pressure and is always lower than PIP in volume controlled modes and is approximately equal to inspiratory pressure in pressure controlled modes. Rising plateau pressures in volume modes can indicate that compliance of the lung is reduced. Potential causes of falling compliance include pulmonary edema, ARDS, pneumonia, pneumothorax, pleural effusions, extrapulmonary causes such as abdominal hypertension or worsening burns edema. Clinical examination with assistance of imaging from x-ray or ultrasound should be able to differentiate the cause. The purpose of a low pressure alarm is to detect when air mix is escaping from the circuit to a degree that the circuit pressure drops. This can be either an absolute pressure or the inspiratory pressure. The former is also sometimes known as a low CPAP or low PEEP alarm. The threshold for the alarm is set to 2 to 5 centimetres of water below the set PEEP and a failure to maintain this is a sign of a major leak. In the latter, the alarm can be set between 5 and 10 centimetres of water below the expected PIP. Failure to achieve this value suggests a major leak, including disconnection. Confirmation can be achieved by the loss of a capnograph trace and the failure of the chest to rise and fall. These alarms are designed to measure more subtle loss of gas from the ventilator circuit patient system. Usually they are set to record a deficit in expiratory volume from inspiratory volume of greater than 10%. These alarms will be triggered by smaller leaks than pressure alarms. Examples include a leak around an underinflated cuff, through an access port in the system, and from suctioning. In pressure controlled modes, the tidal volume delivered is dependent on the pressure applied and the compliance and resistance of the system. Modern ventilators record average volumes and alarm when sudden deterioration of volumes occur, suggesting a marked change in the resistance compliance characteristics. Reasons for this include increased respiratory rate in assisted modes, pressure support settings are too high for the patient, or less commonly, changes in the patient's resistance compliance in pressure supported modes resulting in higher tidal volumes. The most important issue here is to determine why the patient suddenly has a higher respiratory drive, usually related to pain, anxiety, 
hypoxia or acidosis, fever and pulmonary embolism. The apnea alarm is important in modes where initiation of the breath is entirely triggered by the patient, for example pressure support modes. In these circumstances, if the patient becomes apneic, no ventilation will occur and the patient would rapidly deteriorate. Most ventilators, in addition to alarming, will cycle into a mandatory backup rate when this alarm is triggered. The most important alarm to be aware of is the oxygen supply failure. The most common cause of this alarm is a fault in the delivery system such as an empty gas bottle. Catastrophic loss of institutional piped oxygen is extremely rare, but for this eventuality, spare oxygen bottles are routinely kept near the clinical area. Similarly, many ventilators require a source of medical air to mix with the oxygen to generate a specific FiO2. A pressure sensor monitors the supply. The inspired FiO2 is also monitored. If the delivered FiO2 falls lower than the concentration set on the ventilator, an alarm is delivered. Potential causes for this are that the FiO2 has inadvertently or intentionally been changed upwards, as the ventilator sometimes takes a few breaths to catch up, an oxygen analyzer error or an oxygen source failure. These causes are usually easily differentiated and may require a replacement to the ventilator itself. Most ventilators will provide a visual, if not audible, alarm for disconnection of the ventilator from a power source. When on battery mode, they'll also alarm when power is reduced to a potentially dangerous level. These alarms should be identified and dealt with promptly. Probably the first action required from any alarm is to look at the patient. If the patient is distressed, two broad groups of problems can be at fault. A patient-related problem and a ventilator-related problem. These two groups can be rapidly differentiated by removing the patient from the ventilator and connecting them to a manual ventilation device, such as a self-fulfilling bag valve system. Not only does this potentially narrow down the cause, but if the problem is ventilator in origin, it immediately relieves the issue. If the problem is not immediately apparent, a distressed patient on the ventilator is a potential critical emergency and early help should be sought. Following these initial steps, a stepwise approach can help in determining the underlying cause as described previously. In modern ICU practice, it is easy to become fatigued to the sound of yet another alarm sounding. In some cases, alarms do not even register with our consciousness, a situation that clearly places the patient at higher risk. It can be tempting to silence annoying alarms as well. This clearly defeats their purpose and should be avoided in most circumstances. In this video, we've addressed the major alarms and the action required to address them. Alarms play an essential role in protecting the patient from inadvertent injury, should be reviewed regularly, and should be treated with respect.